Ted Sabas, welcome back to CWRT Congress. Ted, are you there? I am. <laughs> uh, nice to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's, it's wonderful you. that you are Love back. You. And Love you know, our, our first interview with you uh, has been on our YouTube channel and is the second most viewed video that we have. Well, that's disappointing. Yeah, I, I know that uh, John Fazio, we, we had a premiere last week and and he took uh, he took over the uh, the lead. Yeah, he's really good. It was good. And and that's really to say that uh, uh, a lot for your brand and its popularity. We have great customers. Now you have generously offered to hold a drawing to give some to three lucky members of the audience. Can you tell us a bit about these books, starting with? Discovering Gettysburg by Coleman and Hartman. Sure, and I wish I had thought ahead and brought three copies home with me, um, one of each. Yeah, <clears throat> real quick, Discovering Gettysburg, the unique aspect of that is Steve Coleman, the main author, went to Gettysburg, didn't know anything about it, fell in love with it, and went back over and over and over and tried to figure out interviewed everybody, interviewed the storekeepers, interviewed everybody you could possibly think of. And he just tours Gettysburg. So you, it feels like you're walking with him throughout the whole field. It's very interesting. And his friend, who's a professional cartoonist, Tim Hartman, is in, uh, I think, a lot of the Pittsburgh papers and Pennsylvania and Michigan and things. And he drew caricatures of the generals, some of the people he interviewed, and they're throughout the book. And it's it's really good, and I'm, uh, I think we're toward the end of the second printing, I think, and wow. uh, I thought that would be a, a good one that people might want to read. Well, I should say, and, and then there's the, uh, the famous David Powell book, Failure in the Saddle. Failure in the Saddle, that, that's a, a complete re-examination of Confederate cavalry in the Chickamauga campaign, and what he does <clears throat> is he explains how the cavalry worked, why neither cavalry commander, Wheeler or Forrest, did very well in the Chickamauga campaign. But what's most fascinating is you understand Braxton Bragg's problems south of Chattanooga and trying to figure out what the heck Rosecrans is doing. You figure it out. It's a, it's a great way to see just how poorly, especially, Joe Wheeler did. And so Bragg was really running around with his eyes closed for quite a while. And that book was very eye-opening. And of course, it's David Powell, so it's really outstanding. Yeah. And and the, uh, the third one is Caught in the Maelstrom by Clint Crow. Yeah, I'm really sad to say Clint died uh, suddenly just maybe a month or so ago. Uh, he only had a chance to give a couple of talks. I believe this was his first book. Oh. Um, he wasn't too old. I mean, he was uh, I, 55 or 60, I think. And his brother had contacted us and said that really the high point of his life was getting this book published. He'd been working on it a long time. And, uh, and they'd never seen him happier than when he was out giving a, a couple talks that they watched him give. So uh, I, I'm really happy that we were able to play a small role in that. Uh, Caught in the Maelstrom is about the Indian War, Civil Wars. So you see a lot of what was going on in Missouri and Oklahoma and Arkansas from the perspective, both sides, but especially the perspective of the, of the Indians themselves and what was happening to them and how the war affected the families and the kids. Uh, it's really, really an amazing, uh, uh, amazing study. And it's a lot of military history and all that, but you get, it goes a level deeper and, and, and does a lot of the social stuff that you don't see often. Uh, it's, it's very good. I think you'll enjoy it. Sounds fantastic. Hey, we would really like to be able to announce the winners when they're selected. Selected. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Okay. You, you've also uh, offered to give uh, new accounts with Savas Speedy a $5 credit. And well, that's when I thought I was being compensated. And then there, there you go. That's, uh, that's just the way that it, that it is, I guess. No, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, you know, I, I thought that we'd start with a softball question. And uh, 
and then work our way up to the secret sauce. Whatever yeah. that might be. And yeah, I'm, 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 you know, it's secret. So I, I suppose none of us is really going to learn it. But uh, if you had to explain what you do in one sentence, what would it be? I had to explain what I do in one sentence. Um, how about two words? Risk management. <laughs> okay. You want yeah, to? It's true. It, it really is. It's very interesting. The publishing business is, is unique in a lot of ways. And it's all about risk management constantly in, in so many different ways. For example, what book do you select? What's it going to cost to print? What's it going to cost to develop? What's it going to be like to work with the author? How do you manage expectations? How do you go? Because the process isn't two or three months. It's usually two or three years. It's a, it, it's a, it's a big process. And in this business, it's very easy. And you, I've seen this with many publishers, uh, just like any business, really. But if you, you can make two or three, four bad decisions and you're done. I mean, you can really just be done. So it's very, it's very, uh, it's a very artful and mathematic sort of balancing act. And so I would say, what do I do? I, I manage risk. <laughs> I'm not a book publisher. I'm actually, uh, I'm in the information business. So what do I do? I produce information and I balance the risk while doing it. Wow. So what subjects sell the best and uh, what do you think that is? I wrote a column, uh, in fact, I wrote a column of maybe five, six, seven years ago on a blog. I reprinted it once. I think I'll, uh, I'll try to dig it out and reprint it again. And it was the only way I was going to come back into the publishing business is if I didn't have to publish anything on Gettysburg ever again. <laughs> and <laughs> there's, <laughs> look at Rich up there. He's clapping. Yeah, it's very hard. It's weird giving these talks when everybody's muted because you can't tell if people are booing or cheering or clapping. Or there you go, little animation. Um, and how stupid that that really was because Gettysburg. I, I look. I love Gettysburg. I love studying Gettysburg. It's really endless. There's so many things you can do, but there's so much to the Civil War, and I really like it all. I mean, I like it all, and people really want to read Gettysburg. Now they like a lot of other things, but that is always, always the subject that sells the best. Now, part of it is they have a big visitor center. They have a lot of traffic. Uh, it gets, it's very high profile, new people coming in. One of the first things they stumble across is Pickett's Charge in Gettysburg. So, you know, there's that, but Gettysburg just sells really well. Gettysburg is sort of a subset of battle histories, right? Battles, campaigns, they continue to sell extremely well. And how many here really enjoy reading battles and campaign studies? Yeah, see, I mean, that's most of the hands. Um, and I'm gonna ask a bunch of questions of you guys later, because I have uh, some, some information I'd like to get from you. But those are the ones that sell really the best, battles and campaign studies uh, with Gettysburg at the top. And you are reprinting the Batchelder papers. And uh, how do you go about handling such a mammoth project like that? Oh, it's mammoth. And, and it, it doesn't seem like it probably from the outside, just how mammoth it is. Uh, luckily, I have, I have five gals in the office who are organized. And they really know their stuff. And in fact, I'll tell you a funny story about that in just, just a second. So. Does everybody know, who doesn't know what the Batch Elder Papers are? Everybody knows? So those have been out of print for 25 years. And I think a secondary set today is $800 to $1,000. <clears> and over the last five, six years, people have been saying, Savas, republish, Savas, republish. But you can't really republish them and reset all the type and do all that. It's just, it's, it's just be time consuming and impossible. But I found out that Audrey Ladd was still alive and she and her husband were the ones who, you know, got the papers and started reprinting them and, so, and, and, and got Morningside to reprint. So I talked to her and got permission to, to, to get this done. And what we had to do is we had to find a set of books, 
fact, I've got to replace them. And you have to cut them open. And then you have to lay page by page, and we found a very high quality uh, photographic uh, inst uh, place that photographs every page. <clears throat> so we ended up recreating what is, is called a facsimile edition. So it looks the same as the original. And then we had to create all our front matter. I got Eric Wittenberg to write the foreword. So we produced all new front matter that sort of matches how that looks. So we have that. And then you got to select the binding and the cloth and design all that stuff. But the big, the big problem, and they're printed now and they're on a ship and they're on their way. The, uh, the problem is, is that we're not selling them into the trade. So our warehouse isn't handling these. That means our office is handling these. This is not a huge office because most stuff is outsourced. So it's probably, I don't know, 1,400 square feet. So the girls called me out one day because I don't think about this stuff. <clears throat> they said, we need to have a meeting. And whenever they, whenever your five wives tell you, you need to have a meeting, it's, oh no. So I walked out and sat down. I said, okay, let's have a meeting. And they said, so I don't know that you're giving this as much thought as you need to give it. So what do you mean? They go, well, we're going to get 1500 books here. I said, yeah. She says, well, how are we going to organize these and get them out? I'm like, hmm. Well, I just figured you guys would figure it out. Well, they had. And so out of Sarah's office comes this big whiteboard. They already had it done and they mapped out exactly how they were going to do it, how they were going to organize it, what the assembly line in the office would look like, who's going to do what, and uh, they've got it ready to go. But it's a big process. Uh, I think we've got 500 sets that we're printing. I think we've sold <clears throat> 450 maybe already. Wow. And we're going to hold back. I'm probably going to hold back 10 sets just for my kids and my family and that sort of thing. And so we've got maybe 40 sets left and we sell several a day. So, I mean, they'll probably be gone before the books arrive. And then we have to organize how they go out and pack them up and all that. So it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big project. So I, I recently received an email that said that they're probably going to be shipping in August. Yeah, we, we had our part done on time and they were supposed to be here uh, middle of June, third week of June. And then of course the virus hit. And I'll tell you when the virus hit right after we were just starting to do this, I honestly, I got real, I got real worried. I, I mean, I really got worried and I don't worry about a, month, a lot, but I got worried because it's a huge financial commitment. And I started realizing, boy, if everything closes down and everybody loses their jobs, what the heck are we going to do? How are we going to pay for all this? Cause it's not, that's not our only set of books, right? We've got all kinds of things at printers and, expenses. And the people just came through and everybody was very excited. And, and, and so we're going to be okay. But the virus has really thrown the international shipping industry into turmoil. And uh, so it's, uh, they're, some, they're on a dock somewhere, or I think they're just getting ready to get onto a ship and, and they'll be here. So. Wow. Yeah. So, so, you know, we like to keep uh, all of us like to keep our ears to the ground and sometimes to the railroad track. And uh, there seems to be a rumor that you're going to be reprinting Ed Barr's Vicksburg campaign trilogy. I got the contract back today uh, from, from Ed. <clears throat> I've been dealing with Ed's daughter, Jenny, and Ed is 97. He's very hard of hearing and he's doing well. Uh, for those of you who, who know Ed, you'll be happy to hear that uh, he went to his doctor's appointment the other day, and he no longer needs his blood pressure medication. I mean, the man's 97, and he takes no medications. It's typical Ed, right? Yeah. And uh, But, of course, he can't, can't walk very as like he used to and all that because he's 97. But, uh, yeah, so we, uh, we had to go through the uh, winding sort of who owns the rights kind of thing because Morningside books never did contracts. Oh. It was just, I used to tell Bob, Bob, you can't do that. You got to have contract. Ah, oh, you don't need contract. And so he didn't have a contract and then he sold part of the business and somebody else kind of had the rights and maybe they didn't and all that. So it's taken a while, but we've got it sorted out. And so we are going to be reprinting Ed Bars' set and we just sent out a bunch of book plates because Ed, uh, the, the hand that he signs with was the hand that was, shot up in World War II, that part of his body. 
so his hand is, is crippled. It's very hard for him to sign, even in the best of times. But his daughter said he can sign, you know, three, four, five book plates a day. And so we're going to have him sign some special book plates for the Vicksburg set. He's very excited to have it back in print. Uh, Terry Winchell, the former chief historian at Gettysburg, is writing the foreword. Uh, Terry, who's probably the nicest human being I've ever met in my life. Truly, he is. Uh, he and Ed go way back, and Ed is just tickled pink. His daughter said, getting Terry to do it sealed the deal for Ed to have, to have it come back into print. And so uh, we will be reprinting that sometime next year, and we'll, we'll make the announcement soon. Wow, that's wonderful. So what drives the decision to reprint a book or a, a, a volume set? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's been out of print forever. It's a great set, nothing like it. And it, it commands a very high price on the secondary market. And there are a lot of people, I, I'm not kidding, I get probably a request every other day in some form from somebody asking, are you gonna ever reprint? Or do you know where I can get a copy of the set? So there's a, there's a demand for it. And so if it's handled sort of like we handled the batch elder papers, uh, you know, then it can be profitable for us so we can pay our costs and pay, you know, for, for all the work that has to be done on the labor side. And then we can get you know, good books into people's hands who just can't afford a set today who really want to read it. And so I think it's, you know, we're doing good and doing well at the same time. So if we can handle both sides of that risk management, right, Mike, um, yeah. then, uh, you know, then we're excited about doing it. Excellent. Say, I, I don't know of any child that grows up and says, I want to be a publisher. So during your childhood, what did you want to become? A rock and roll star. Like half of us, right? Um, really, uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, how you, you look back at your life. I mean, all of us have, right? We all look back at our lives and what we were like when we were children. And you can see the adult in the child. And I remember when I was about five and I used to write stories, my mom used to make them in little books and we'd make covers and <clears throat> staple them or, or use thread and make them, put them together. And I still have a couple somewhere. And we, and I had these little books when I was five. And I mean, who knew, right? And I've always loved books. And so it got to the point where uh, I would write articles and do this kind of thing about his practicing law and then sort of got into the into the publishing world sort of by accident. But, uh, you know, I was always sort of involved with books and putting books together since I was a little kid. So can you explain your dual careers as a rocker and a publisher? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I used to play professionally in a rock band. We had the bus and did the touring and all that stuff. And, uh, and I woke up on a pool table one day in south of Chicago somewhere. It's a true story. And one of the big bands that we used to play with quite a bit, where they were on their way up, they were opening for Bob Seger, opening for Sticks, that kind of thing. And they were the hardest working band I ever knew, and they broke up. And I'm sitting there looking around at our band, and I'm thinking, woke up on a pool table. I don't know where I am. This, this is crazy. And I had most of a degree. I used to type my term papers in dressing rooms. Uh, and my teachers were really good about it. And I finally decided I was going to go back to school. And so I put my bass, I played bass and, I played, uh, bass and keyboards. And I put my bass down, never touched it again. And for 32 years, never touched it. And my brother was the, was the guitarist in the band, one of the guitarists in the band. And uh, we sort of accidentally picked it back up again and started noodling around in, in 2014. And my brother and I said, you know, why don't we get guys together who are good musicians and just play in Northern Cal? And so we got other guys who were used to be pros and, and, and played professionally. And now we, we, uh, we play, we don't play like Holiday Inn stuff. We play like concert open, open for bigger bands. And so I've gotten to play with a, a, a lot of acts that, that I used to go see in stadiums when I was a kid. And so now we'll, you know, play with them and now they're, they're playing clubs. And so we'll open for them and play for 35 minutes or 45 minutes and sit in the dressing room with Judas Priest singer and, and uh, UFOs drummer. And yeah, it's, it's wild. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we, we, does anybody know who Pat Travers is? 
guys know Pat, Pat Travers? Boom, boom, I'll go the lights and uh, drinking whiskey. So he was really big in the 80s. And I, I was in the, we played with him three times. And I was in the dressing room the last gig. And I said to him, um, he shares the dressing room, which is really nice. And I said to Pat, I said, you know, I got to tell you something, Pat. I said, we had just gotten done playing and he's getting ready to go on. And I said, uh, your song, uh, Boom, Boom, I'll Go the Lights. I used to play that song in 1981. He puts his arm around my shoulder and he says, Brother Ted, that means both of us are getting old. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but that's, that's my fun. That's my yoga. I don't golf. I don't, uh, uh, you know, we play, uh, we play a gig, uh, about a gig a month. So that's what we do. Yeah. So my next question was, which is the most fun? But I think that we all know the answer to that oh, one. Yeah, trust me, you do. Yeah. So what, what's the hardest part of, uh, of your publisher gig? Um, <clears throat> the hardest part, Chris Bryan will probably be able to answer this one. Probably, if, I probably have a few other authors on here. Um, I know Mike uh, Kirscher's writing, working on a book. The hardest thing is getting to do what you love to do the most, which is work with the authors. Uh, the problem with running a business, uh, especially in California, is you get sucked away into all of the administrative aspects of the business. And you have to do so much other work that really isn't publishing related. So probably two, three hours a day are, you know, administrative stuff, just dealing with headaches, dealing with problems, dealing with forms, dealing with whatever, uh, you know, taxes and this kind of stuff. So you, you, you can't do what you love to do. So when you started in the business, you got to do what you love to do all the time. And now, like, you know, Chris will tell you, he's constantly, he's calling me. He's even on my front door the other day, knocking on my door, saying, when are you going to get to my manuscript? And it, it's just, you get 200 emails a day and you're, you know, you're spending half your day doing other things. It's, it, that's the hardest thing is not being able to get to what you really want to do. And that is delve into the manuscripts and work with the authors. That's what I love the most. You know, I, I've uh, met some of your authors and, and have been working with, uh, with a number of them over the last five or six months. I, I agree. The, these guys are great. They really are great. And they are. Sp speaking about great, uh, your staff is... Wait, 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 wait. It's not just these guys. We've got Jan Kroon here. Oh, of course we do. I'm, well, I meant that in the most... Uh, you yeah. better stop right there, Mike. Uh, I probably should. So your staff is extra special. Would you tell us about them, please? Yeah, you know, that, that's, yeah, I, I would. So uh, Sarah, Sarah Keeney, and many of you have emailed Sarah Keeney or have dealt with Sarah Keeney. Sarah Keeney, I met when she was nine years old. And uh, I was in a gym working out down in San Jose. And her dad has this, like a, a, a Red River shirt on a t-shirt and I said oh the Red River campaign he said yeah he said that's the Civil War and I said yeah I said I know I, I said I know a little bit something about it and he's and he said well my my uh one of my relatives was in a, a regiment he was a Confederate colonel and I said well who was it he said well you you wouldn't know who he was and I said no he said his name was uh James Beard and I said oh the Consolidated Crescent Regiment Louisiana the guy about fell over <laughs> Turns out they had a bunch of letters and, and things. And I ended up writing an article about, about him and or somewhere. And so I got to meet him and Sarah was his daughter. And she was there when I brought home my daughter from the hospital in, on, uh, on the 4th of July, 1991. And so we just always kept in touch as our family was close. Sarah goes to college and she's in college when I'm getting sucked back into the publishing world. So this is 2003. She graduates, I think in 2003 or 2004. And and she started doing a little bit of work for me before she graduated. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I, I need to start putting together a staff because here we go again. And so I said, I need to hire the first person. And I put out my job requirements. And she said, that's Sarah. I called Sarah up. I said, do you want to work for me? And here's what you're, you know, I'm going to do. And she had a background in journalism and marketing. And she said, yeah, I'd love to. And she's been with me ever since. So Sarah's been with me for 16 years. Um, so she's, and she's a, uh, just like my other, she's like a, another daughter. She's wonderful. Um, then there's Lois. Lois is out in front. She's uh, administrative director of the office. And Lois 
is sort of a CPA kind of person and she handles all that sort of thing. We were interviewing for a position um, for an, uh, an author liaison, a marketing sort of person. <clears throat> and these two, these two uh, uh, ladies came in and interviewed and we loved them both. And we just didn't want to hire one or the other. And we ended up hiring both. And because they both could work about 30 hours a week, they didn't need to work 40. And so we hired Sarah Clausen, who Mike, I know you work with Sarah quite a bit, and Jan, I mean, you know all these people. And the other one's uh, uh, Lisa Murphy. And so we hired both of those two together. And I think it's been three years, a little over three years uh, for those two. And then Donna handles all of our accounts. She, she manages and opens up the accounts and satisfies the accounts and does all that. And Donna's been with me for oh, like four and a half or five years, I think. Um, so those are the people that are, you know, that are, that are here in the office. Renee just left a little bit ago. Renee did a lot of author work and, and marketing and she was here. Everybody else is outsourced. So editors, designers, everybody else is not in the office. They're all, all over, actually all over the world. Very good. So let's go back to publishing. Can you uh, name a book you were sure was going to be a success, but wasn't? Sure was going to be a success, but wasn't. Yes, I can. Uh, we have a book called um, Robert Rhodes. It's General Rhodes right, uh, from the Army in North Virginia. I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head. And the manuscript was good. The book is good. The book's well-researched. And, and I really thought this book is going to be a, a good, strong seller. Well, it won the Douglas Alpha Freeman Award. I think it won a second award. And it's still in its first printing 10 years later. Wow. And the reason is, yeah, I, somebody, Kurt, your eyes just went up and like, holy. The reason is, it, it, you know, again, I don't remember the author, so it's not personal. Well, it's kind of personal. Is if you don't have authors supporting the books, they won't sell. And he just really wouldn't do much and, or couldn't do much. Maybe that was, maybe that was the case. But anyway, I was sure it was going to sell really well. It's an incredibly good book. And I think we're down to like maybe 50 copies or 100 copies or something. Uh, but it didn't sell nearly as well as I thought. And I thought for sure it'd be a two or three hardcover print run and then into paper. So that was, uh, that was a real disappointment. How about the, uh, the other side of that, a book that you were kind of lukewarm on that uh, went uh, crazy? Um, yeah, actually one right now. Uh, Eric Wittenberg's new book on seceding from secession. Uh, he wrote that book. It's about West Virginia, the formation of West Virginia. And, and you know, it's a good book. Yeah, a lot of legal stuff and constitutional stuff and some little military stuff. And it puts it in the context of the war. And it's very interesting. I mean, it's very interesting. But I wasn't sure how our audience would like it. Could we market it the right way? Uh, and it sold out uh, two weeks after we shipped. Wow. And we're, yeah, I, we're... I think you can still get copies online because the, there's still some left, but we're already in the middle of the second reprint uh, uh, of a first reprint. And it's just, we're very shocked. And the reviews are piling in and they're all great. We're very surprised. We thought it would do okay, but it's done really, really well. Seceding from the secessionists. Yeah. Seceding from secession. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I recently learned that, uh, that you, uh, have some books uh, printed overseas. How, how does that work out for you? It works out fine. I hate printing overseas. I want to say that up front. I don't like it. I want to print everything in the United States, period. And for most of the years we have, we still do 95% of our books in the States. Almost and if, every book we print overseas, except this batch elder sets the first set, uh, their color. Because unfortunately, you cannot afford to print color books in the United States. And it is, it breaks my heart. I mean, it really does. I will not print in a communist country. I mean, Chinese printers call me all the time. No, not interested. 
So we only print in, in, in free countries. So uh, we've printed in India. They're wonderful. Indian, they're just great. They do great work. Uh, we've printed in the Czech Republic. Um, I think we've printed in Spain. But, uh, but usually, it's, um, <clears throat> usually it's India or the Czech Republic. Depends on where, they're, where the books are going to go to. But color in the United States, the setup costs, it's just, it's so ridiculous. Quite literally, the cost is at least double, sometimes triple, wow. even including shipping from overseas. So how many of you have some of our Civil War atlases, like the, Brad, the, the, the maps of series? Yeah. The only way, if we printed that in the United States, that'd be a $99 book. Well, you can't do it. You can't sell it. And, and so we have to print those overseas. Because remember, we could print it in the United States if we were printing 100,000 copies or 50,000 copies. But these are Civil War books. So, you, you know, you print 5,000 copies. And so the unit cost is high. And, and you, you just can't afford to do it. So you have to print overseas. The Batch Elder Papers, we probably could have charged quite a bit more for the, for the set. But two things, number one, I wanted to make a decent profit on it, get all our expenses paid and get them into the hands of people. And number two, I wanted to make sure that people could afford them. And so they're big books, I mean, they're big books. We're only doing 500 copies. When you set up a 500 print run, it, the, the, the unit cost is very high. And so if you go overseas, the unit cost is significantly lower. And so that allowed us to keep our costs down. And since we had to print color books at the same time, we threw it onto that print run and that's what it's coming back with. So that, that's why. So, so does that make any difference to your customers in any meaningful way? No, I mean, the, the, we use all Western products. It's the same paper from the same paper mills. Um, uh, the, the bindings often, I mean, a lot of the, most of the products that they use to print the book are American made. So there really is no difference. They just bind up, they just print them there. So it's. So you stayed pretty tight in your lane of nonfiction, civil war and military history. Are there other publishers with a similar focus? <clears throat> huh. you, don't, you don't have to name names. No, I, I, honestly, I would, I would name names if I could, if I could think of some. History Press, I guess is, uh, I think they're primarily civil war focused. Uh, Arcadia Press, I, th I think they do more of the Southeast United States stuff, but they do a lot of Civil War stuff. But there aren't many left. Uh, um, Broadfoot books, but but Tom does more reference stuff, right? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't. There aren't really that many of us left that do almost exclusively Civil War. Maybe you guys can think of somebody else. I'm I'm not I'm not sure. So occasionally you do oh. drive out of your lane, and why is that? Why is it? Yeah. Because I drink too much of this. Oh, the honey. Yeah. I had a little bit because my throat's sore today. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry, your question was, why do I go out of the lane? Yeah. Uh, when, 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 uh, when do you get uh, the urge? Yeah. Um, two reasons. One, we can afford to go out of the lane because there's something that really needs to get published and it won't otherwise be published. And so if I can earn enough money back to justify it, uh, even if it doesn't quite cover everything, um, I'll do it. And um, so like we just did a big book on the German order of battle in World War II for the, for, uh, for the Wehrmacht. And over time, that's going to earn its money back. But that was an expensive book, but it needed to get done. And, uh, and there's you know several regimentals and different kinds of things we've done like that. Um, and sometimes I just go out of the lane because I really, really love what we, what, what the opportunity was, even though I wasn't sure I was going to do. Six Days in September, Alex Racino's book is one of those books where I read his uh, self-published version and I, I fell in love with it. I thought it was one of the great, one of the potentially great novels of the Civil War. And uh, so I went to him and we, you know, redid quite a bit of it and fixed it up and did some things and added some things. And you know, it, uh, you know, we've, we've made back our money on it and stuff, but it's, you know, it's in a fiction is hard. I don't know if a lot of you know this. Um, when you go into a bookstore 
if you see books on an end cap or on a table, the publisher is paying to have those there. If you see books that are face out on the shelf, the publisher pays to have those face out on the shelf. If you pay, if you see books, uh, you know, stacked up with a sign, bestsellers or whatever, publishers pay to have those there. And when you're a small publisher, you can't compete with Simon and Schuster and and Macmillan and the rest of the, you know the rest of those. You you, you can't. <clears throat> so so our books are if they're if they're carried, we don't we don't get. You know what? I've never explained this before, and a lot of people ask me this. A lot of people will say, "Well, Ted, my book is out, but it's not in my Barnes and Noble." And I explain, "Well, here's how they get chosen for the Barnes and Noble. They have regional buyers. The regional buyers look at their foot traffic, look at what people buy, and then they figure out what they're going to actually put on the shelves. And if you've noticed, Civil War stuff ten years ago had ten shelves. Five years ago, it had." four shelves. Now it's got two shelves. So they're cutting down the number of books while there's still a lot of books coming out. And the big publishers usually get the first crack. So you see the same kind of stuff all the time. And so we don't get to choose which ones go into what stores. So for example, Chris Bryan, I'll use your, your upcoming book on, uh, on Banks' core, um, uh, you know, around Cedar Mountain time. So Let's say, and I'm just making these numbers up just for discussion's sake, because I think a lot of people find this interesting. I hope you do. Let's say Barnes & Noble comes in and they're going to pick up 500 copies nationwide. You think, well, that's not very many. Well, actually, in today's market from Barnes & Noble, it, it is, oddly, sadly. So let's say they pick up 500 copies. Well, there might be, in a region, let's say that there's uh, 50 stores. 30 of those stores might not have a copy at all. Uh, half uh, t uh, 10 of the stores uh, that are left of the 20 might have one book each and the other stores might have the rest. They dictate that we have, we have zero control over that. Now there have been some books that we've had that will do an end cap special. We'll pay a little bit extra for something, but it's a bigger book playing with the enemy. Uh, Once a Marine that we did, these are sort of bigger, broader market books and we've had some success. But that's how books get put into these bookstores. And that's why you see what you see in the bookstores. They're, they're being paid. Those are, those are placement ads for the books. Wow. So if, if you were going to give someone advice on how to prepare for pu the publishing field, what would that advice be? Prepare to be a publisher or to prepare to work in the field? No, let's go both. <laughs> Don't be a publisher. Now let's go to the other part. All right, to work in the field. Well, I, I joke, it, it, you know, <laughs> it, if you're gonna be a niche publisher like I am, you absolutely have to know a lot about the subject matter or you're dead in the water. And you have to have a, so you know what the sources are, you can check stuff if you're looking at a manuscript, that sort of thing. So you really have to, so whether you're, 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 you want to be a Rose Garden publisher or, a, you know, or, a, or a publisher of horses or a publisher of Civil War stuff, you have, to, you have to really know and love the subject matter. That's important. But there are a lot of people who ask me about, they want to be inside the publishing world somehow. You got to find your niche inside the world, whether it's marketing, whether it's, you know, ghost writing, whether it's, whether it's editing, whether it's the business side. Um, and then just go work. And I always tell people, go work for free if you can you're young go intern and tell them you'll work for free just go do it and if you're really good they'll end up hiring you but you'll get you'll get amazing insight working inside the business you want to work in I mean a lot of you here probably have your own businesses or have but you do whatever you do you know how valuable it is to get hands-on experience in whatever it is you're doing and that's the best way to learn how to be in any business so I bring in a lot of interns, or I used to bring in a lot more than I do, and I give them hands-on, you know, help, and and we, we don't pay them, but they get something on their resume and they learn a lot about it. And I've got two that I had for a while. They're both professionals in the publishing industry today, which is really cool. That is neat, Ted. Before we go to the audience uh, for their questions, um, I know that you have a couple of questions you want to ask and uh, perhaps some other things that you'd like to add. Yeah, I do. 
So I'm really curious because you guys are the ones that are on the other side. I don't get to see your, I don't get to see your vision of us, right? I get to see our vision of what we think we are. And so you're out there, you get our e-letters, you see our books. What kind of stuff do you want to read? What do you, I mean, you, you like the, you know, the next book on Gettysburg or the next book, but is there anything in particular you really want to read that's not being covered? And I don't mean like a real micro topic, but just naval stuff on this or, <clears throat> or uh, more regimentals or I mean, what, what, what interests you? Cause I think we have a pretty good cross section of people here. I'm just curious. What, what do you want them to do, Mike? Do you want them to like unmute and say something and mute again or how do you? Well, you know, it, it's, it's going to be easier for, uh, I, I think for, for all of us, if, if they would um, um, put them in I, the chat, because then, then I'll, I'll print it and send it to you. Got it. That'd be great. Yeah. That'd be really helpful. Yeah. So if you guys could do that, that would be very helpful. I mean, do you, is, is, there, is there a need for more studies on strategy and tactics? What would you hold up there, Bill? I held up two books that are authors that are in our Civil War Roundtable. Steve Magnuson's book, To My Best Girl, about Rufus Dawes and his, and his fiance and their letters back and forth. And the, it's a love story that goes through the war. And the thing that's interesting about it is that the love story carries the military history along with it, like a river. And, ah. and so it, it intertwines between the love story and the, and the so that the time is a river theme works. The other one is, is um, Nikki Schofield's uh, got a series of historical fiction books that once again use romance as a way of moving the plot along to tell the historic the history of the war. And and so that's just one category that I, I wanted to directly answer your question. Well that's interesting. We we did in a little outside of our lane, we did a book called uh, Captain and His Lady, I think it was, by a bar. And it was a whole bunch of letters from a guy. And it was exactly like you're describing Western theater stuff, great letters of battle history. And, and it was his relationship on the home front and all that was, and it, it sold out. I mean, it did pretty well. We were kind of surprised, but. Well, one, one of the pieces that makes it work is that this is, this is the story of Ohio and Indiana and the Morgan raid coming through. So there's this local piece to it that we all want to know more about. And it's a different angle on it. And it's not dry history at all. It's, it's got some real, you know, right. uh, carbon to it. <laughs> and, it's, and it's different. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but you have to have, on the other hand, when you're reading this, you have to have the battle maps and the maps of, of the, the progression of the troops and sure. how they move and how the forces moved in reaction to those forces, where the rivers are. I mean, you've got to have the detail from your, right. your materials. Which, 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 which generals do you think are sorely in need of a really good biography? I would really love to hear, like if you guys type for like chat and so I can get that printed out, I really like to know. I mean, one of the guys I've, I've been trying to get somebody to work on it and I think I, I think I've got one is I think Bolgard really needs a good biography. And I, I can, I think announce, he didn't tell me that I couldn't. Do you all know who Richard McMurray is? Two great rebel armies. And uh, he wrote a, a hood biography years ago. And in fact, uh, Paul, you sort of look a little bit like Richard did about 20 years ago. <clears throat> Richard is 80 something, I think 80. Um, absolute first-class writer, first-class researcher, phenomenal speaker, uh, and a fun guy. And he is finishing up a big two-volume, brand-new biography on Joe Johnston. And it looks like we're going to publish it. And we're very excited about that. That's somebody else I think that desperately needs a good good book. But if you guys can think of it, who you'd like to 
who do you'd like to read a, a, a good biography on, who really needs one, uh, let me know. Because I have a lot of historians who routinely write to me and say, I need a new project. Uh, I'm thinking of this or I'm thinking of that. And what about this? And I'd love to, to pitch some of these to some people. And, you know, if it's one of your topics, you know, that means you've played a part in sort of crafting it. So I, I would really, really like to hear from you on that. So Ted, one of the, uh, one of the things I took away from CWI last year was um, having the ability to, to go to a, a spot on a battlefield and to read what, uh, what some of the uh, partic participants said that they were seeing and feeling and hearing at that time. You know, that, that kind of a... Um, uh, so like a firsthand account of, of, of what it was like to be there. Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and then maybe balance that off both sides. I just got, I just got a letter. I just got a submission from, from a gal who has the most beautiful English accent. She sounds like she's about 35 and she must be about 80. <laughs> I was talking to her uh, the other day on the phone and she submitted his collection. It's letters from a guy who was a, I want to say an Illinois soldier, and they are the most detailed, beautiful letters I've ever read. They are, they are magnificent. And, and I said to her, the letters, did you make these up? I mean, are you filling in the, she said, oh, no, no. She was, I mean, I added a couple commas here and there to some, some readability, and, but no, it's, they're, they're, so I said, well, can you send me some samples of the actual letters so I can see? And she did. And, you know, she cleaned up a little spelling and stuff. But the letters are maybe one of the best letter collections I've ever read. And it's Shiloh and, you know, Donaldson and Shiloh and, and uh, Vicksburg. And, and they are magnificent. The Shiloh stuff is absolutely incredible. And so I think we'll be publishing that. And that's pretty much what you're talking about. He's, he's in the back in Shiloh at first. He's talking about they can hear the fighting way off, right? And then it's slowly coming closer. And then pretty soon a guy runs past him. And soon there's a rabbit that runs past him. And he's way in the back. And, and then pretty soon another guy's. And then pretty soon a bullet goes by his head. And he just develops it and it's, it's incredible. So when you find those, yeah, we do want to publish those kinds of things. Yeah, because then I'm also thinking that if, if we're going to try to attract younger readers and and get them to the battlefield and get them involved in uh, in the community that might be an excellent way how many of you uh are familiar with the emerging civil war series a lot of you yeah <clears throat> now those books obviously are more illustrated than typical books that we do they're really good short reads on a topic um i decided to do those for many reasons chris Mikowski's idea chris chris and and Chris White brought those to me. And one of the reasons was that it's a great way for somebody to read a shorter book on a topic that they might not want to read a 500 page book on. And then they find they really like the subject matter and then they can dig deeper at their own, at their own pace. But the other thing is, is they're, they're easier to read. And we're finding that a lot of people who have never read the Civil War are starting with some of those. And now they're buying uh, you know, they've been reading for a year or two and they're buying other books that we publish that are, you know, bigger, meatier books because they've, you know, they, they've read more on them. So if you ever want to introduce somebody to the Civil War, uh, you know, use the, Amer the Emerging Civil War series. It works. It's, it, it's a good series. I'm, boy, there's a lot of great ideas coming through. Yeah. D.H. Hill. Who wrote D.H. Hill? I so agree. Yeah, D.H. Hill would be a, a really good one. In fact, we're kind of getting close to getting a DHL. Yes, yeah, that was Charles. Yeah, Charles, that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah, this is terrific. Oh, I just found out there's a second page. I'm looking at the names. Oh, yeah. Peter, Dad, yeah, I recognize that name. I think I just spoke to you the other day on the phone. Derek, yeah, good to, good to see you guys. Yeah, these are great suggestions, you guys. I have another question for you. How many get our monthly e-letter? Okay, now, if you don't, 
those of you that aren't raising your hands, I'm sorry, we can't mail you books anymore. Um, <laughs> I, for the, it's a pretty popular newsletter. What I really would like, and I'm very serious about this, is if there's anything in particular you'd like to see, because we have different columns in the newsletter. Uh, you know, our pit bull writes, writes the introduction column and, uh, and she's, you know, it's, it's pretty funny. And, and I got that idea from Tom Broadfoot years ago, the way he wrote his, his, his newsletters. And, uh, but we have, you know, authors, uh, you know, what's, what's new, what's under contract, uh, you know, different segments. What would you like to see? What kind of a column would you like to see every month in our newsletter that would really, you'd go, oh my God, I'm going to read that every month. Is it an interview, a brief interview with an author? Is it questions and answers with an author? Is it what? What is it? What are, what are we missing that you think I would like to see that in the Sabbath baby e-letter? Please, you know, add that to the comment section. Think about it or shoot me an email because I would really like, I, we're trying to make the e-letter, as you know, it's pretty readable. It's, it's, it's fun. There's some humor in it, but it's also very informative and we really want to make it for you because we want you to open it, we want you to read it, we want you to enjoy it. Um, and it, it, it's, it's good for the authors, it's good for everybody. So if there's something in there, please, um, please uh, feel, free to, feel free to tell me. You know, one of the, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I got out of uh, uh, Alex Rossino uh, was the comparison between uh, historical fiction and, and uh, capital H uh, history, and uh, you know something something about how uh, how they may come together or diverge uh, of of some of the books that you're uh, you're publishing. One of the great things about uh, uh, Racino's book on Six Days in September, what that is is it's a fog of war history book about Lee's army in, in the Maryland campaign. It covers six days, uh, basically that. Uh, South Mountain up through uh, up through Sharpsburg, and that that period. And what's really interesting is, is at the end of the book, and I can't remember if this was in his original or it was something I had him add. Is he gives you a biography of all the people and tells you who was real? Because a lot of the characters, almost all the characters, are real. He has a lot of civilians and different people, and these things all happen. What happens in the church and in and, and, and the hospital and inside a private home and and so you find out these people they were real, and he writes about that at the end. I, I love that sort of um, that sort of uh, blending of of fiction and, and nonfiction. There's a Gettysburg book I read as a kid. I can't remember the author's name. I think it was called Three Days at Gettysburg, and it started at the beginning. There was a paragraph, and I found out it was a true story. There's a paragraph and somebody found, it was like in 1910, and a farmer somewhere around Gettysburg uncovered three bodies. And I think there were uh, two Union guys and a Confederate guy or something like that. And in one of the boots, there were still some boot left on one of the feet, there was a $20 gold piece. And so he writes this fictional story based on the three characters and you eventually find out how the guy gets a $20 gold piece, and you know he's going to die and end up in that grave. And so he merged a little bit of, 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 uh, of fact and fiction. It was very, very interesting, very creative. Yeah. Ted, I have the manuscript just saying. Jan, what are you talking about? Oh, it's the, uh, the fiction work book you're working on. <laughs> I'm waiting for the audio text for War Outside My Window, young lady. <laughs> you just stay muted and um boy these are great there's a there's a lot of information here this is terrific question what is the meaning that's an interesting question bill about the what is the meaning of the war between the states you know i'll go off and answer just a cousin of that uh all of you, of course, are aware of what's happening with the statues today and 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 uh, and, and Civil War uh, the Confederate stuff and all that. And I'm, you know, this isn't going to be a political discussion because I, I don't really care where you fall on the issue. Um, it's it's interesting the relationship to me. It, this always interested me. 
Um, and I, I, let me do it this way. When I grew up, and I think I might have said this a little bit the last time, we had a bar, a, a, a lounge, small restaurant bar. And uh, for 25 years growing up, like it was like called the Cheers of Mason City. It was kind of like that. And after work, all these guys would come in in, in the second in the 1970s. And I was a teenager and all these guys would come in. And after the second drink or so, they come in at five, right? 505, 510, 520. The bar would fill up, all these guys, some gals, mostly guys. And after a couple of drinks, they'd start talking. And the universal subject they talked about was World War II because they were all World War II vets. And two or three of them were Germans. They fought for the Germans. And it was fascinating as I used to sit there as a kid and listen to them. And it always, as I loved the Civil War, it always, I always thought, well, what was it like to get a Confederate guy together with a Union guy, you know, 20, 30 years after the war and they're sitting down having drinks? What were they talking about? What was it like? I mean, did they hate each other? Did they, did, did, you know, how did they come to, how did they fight that kind of war and come together? And uh, thankfully, we have a pretty timely book coming out called Patriots Twice. It's very interesting. Um, I almost didn't do it, and Sam Hood pressed me on it. I've published a couple of Sam's books before. And it's very interesting, and it's, it sort of talks about what, how they kind of came together and what they did in the contributions after the war and ran colleges and, you know, pharmaceutical companies and, and uh, taught classes and open schools and that kind of thing. And it's, it's very interesting and a very timely sort of book. So um, I can't remember how the hell I got onto this topic, but that's something new that's coming out. Something, something in one of the, oh, the war between the states things. Uh, yeah, the, how they came together always interested me. So I, 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 you might find that interesting. It'll be out in about a, about a month or so. So Ted, let's, let's go, uh, go through the, uh, the yeah. questions. Sure. And um, so there's one here from Rosemary. It says, have you ever done that kind of project like the Batchelder uh, papers before? No. Have you ever done a, a topic, uh, a project that big? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Okay, I'm, I'm, somebody has their mic unmuted. I'm just, I'm trying to find you. That you, you know what I do want to say, because I'm going to forget it if I don't, because I always forget stuff, and I hate to say something to one person, not say something to another. Hey, Matthew, how you doing? Dr. Lively there, Mr. Uh, where Stonewall Jackson was shot. That guy wrote the book on it right there. Um, where is Dan Welch? I saw his name here somewhere. Dan, are you on? There you are. Yes, yeah. I am. Yeah, I wanted to just give a, give a talk. Uh, Dan is at the end of a project that we've been working on for years, and it's a critical Civil War bibliography. And it is a, uh, like a mini review and books on topics, uh, and it's all organized, and we've been working on it for a long time, and we're, we're in the final stages of that now. Uh, so it's, uh, that's going to be really great. It's one of my favorite favorite books coming up. So Dan, I wanted to give you a shout out because I know you're doing a lot of good work on that. I appreciate it, Ted. It's been a pleasure working with you on it. Author Home Libraries. Matthew, that's a good one. Yeah. So yeah, so, I always found that interesting seeing who, what books everybody had, how they organized them and, you know, how people collected books. I always found that an interesting series when you did that before. That's, the, yeah, that, 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 we should do maybe one of those every month, huh? Yeah, and have, maybe have the author talk just a little bit about their own library with a couple pictures. Yeah. I, I like that. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's good. I'm sorry, Mike, we're digressing. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, Bill uh, Gormley uh, said, what percentage of your work is Civil War uh, related, roughly? 90. <laughs> okay. So Rosemary also asks, uh, how much of the work percentage is outsourced? And then, yeah, go ahead and answer that one. Uh, I, well, it depends. What, what does she mean by outsourced? You mean like the editing and the writing and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Where are you, uh, Rosemary? You want to unmute your mic and answer that? No, I guess she doesn't. Okay. And uh, do you ever do fiction or is Savage Speedy only a nonfiction press? Yeah, the, the six days was fiction. We're doing Guns of September, which is the union side. 
that's fiction. We are not trying to get into fiction. It's too hard to sell. Um, I did that only because I love the Maryland campaign more than I love Gettysburg. And um, so I did those two. Now I know Jan's gonna get mad at me because she keeps pitching a, a fiction book that she's trying to get. And I'm still getting her to do Leroy work. So we'll see. Jan is gonna win, we know that. I uh, no. <laughs> How did you get in, into a relationship with Chris Makowski's emerging civil war? Yeah, Chris, Chris is a great guy. He, Chris, Chris calls me up one day and he goes, hey man, I hope you're having a groovy day. I didn't know who he was. And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, that's Chris. If you know Chris, that's, that's what he says. And, uh, and that's how he starts every email. Hey man, hope you're having a groovy, groovy afternoon. And uh, he starts pitching this idea for emerging civil war. And, and I said, well, you know, we get pitched up all the time. I said, well, go ahead and send it, put it in an email, send it to me. I'll, and he sends me this great prospectus and he, you know, had some sample ideas and, and it just looked good. And he said, look, we've got this great blog. We're going to kick it off this way. We're going to support it. We're going to give talks. We're going to, and the thing that ap appealed to me the most is I, you probably have, many of you have actually told me this. I know just from seeing your names is we publish a lot of first time author stuff that they couldn't get published anywhere else because we're willing to work with them and develop them and, and, and make sure they, they get published because it's worthwhile. They're, maybe it's really terrific research. The writing needs work. That's okay. Or the writing's fantastic. The research is okay, but we give them another year or two and direct them to where else they need to finish their research because university presses, they won't look at them. They'll just, if they respond at all, the big houses aren't going to touch them. And these people have a lot of work involved. And so ECW was an opportunity to have a lot of young historians have an opportunity to write on the topic that was passionate to them. And that is so exciting. Well, Dan, I think, aren't you one of them, Dan Welch? Yes, I did the book called The Last Road North with co-author yeah. Rob Orson on the Gettysburg campaign. Yeah, that's right. Was that your first book? That was my first book, yes. There, so. there, there we go. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, so we're very excited about that. And so that was one of the neat things about being able to do that because I, I, think, it's, I think it's great to have that opportunity to, to be able to help people and then and, and, you know, make them happy and, and uh, kick off their career that way. So John Thompson wants to know, are you going to do any um, audio books? We do a lot of audiobooks. I bet we have probably 30, 40 audiobooks. And um, so you can go on our website, savasbaity.com. And if you click on the books link, which I'm looking at right now, scroll down and uh, it'll say audiobooks. And you can uh, click on there and, and you can go through, uh, go through there. We got a lot of books on audio. And we'll have Leroy's. Uh, we're outside my window on audio if Jan ever finishes the text. She says she's working on it. That's what I hear, yeah. So are, are you going to be printing Chris McElwain's uh, new book? Let me see, which one is that on? That's uh, John Thompson. John Thompson, I don't think so. Although he just pitched me one. Maybe well, that's pitched me. Yeah, I, I don't know, he, th that's his question. Oh, are you on here, Chris? I don't see you. I get pitched so many books all the time. I mean, I get, oh, where are you, Chris? I, 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 I don't see him on here. No, I thought he was. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. So, uh, Kurt DeSoto wants to know, how has your experience as a former lawyer helped out? Well, I'm still licensed and uh, it's helped a lot because I can draft my own contracts and I understand copyright law and, 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 and trademark law and service mark law. And so it's, it's, it's been really good and it, it's just helped me in, in so many different ways. So yeah, it's been, it's been terrific. So Bill Haley asks, what do you think uh, will be the interest in the Civil War with the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the moving and tearing down of all the monuments? I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, 
I'm much more worried about the, the monument sort of craziness of tearing everything down no matter where it stands. I, I it's just, that just bothers me. And, you know, especially on battlefields. I mean, my God, they're in, they're in parks, they're in battlefields. So, you know, it, it, that's my problem with that. I don't want to get political. My problem with that is there's no anchor point. You can't just stop and say, okay, we're done now. Yeah, because it's just, there's, it's like just sliding off a cliff. And so uh, that, that part bothers me. But, um, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, there was a while there about two years ago um, where Amazon, uh, for like just a, a day or three days or whatever, all of a sudden weren't showing images that had a Confederate flag on it on a history book. Well, I mean, it's a history book, right? And so then that sort of stopped. And, you know, I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, I, 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 anytime you start, you start to censoring stuff, I, I don't know where it ends. So uh, uh, Janet Whaley wants to know, are there similar paid placement deals with Amazon? There are. Amazon's full of paid placement deals. If you've ever done a search on Amazon and you see a list of our books, if I search for Savas Baby books, because I'll search on them and I'll sort them and I'll just sort of look through you know, what the reviews are looking like and, you know, that kind of thing. Every once in a while, I'll see a book that isn't ours. And I'll think, what the heck is that? And then I realize there's a little, little word, it'll say sponsored. Or if you search for a book and then you see a line of books that other customers viewed these books, and below that or above that, it'll say sponsored books. Uh -huh. well, we've never done that. Actually, I think we did it once. And so what you do is you pick the words and you pick the topics and you pick the placements of where you want your book to appear. So when somebody's searching for some very popular book on a topic, you want your book to show up next to it somewhere. And that's all paid for. People pay for that. So that's just a good business on, on Amazon's part. And so uh, one of the things, you know, we should talk about this for a second. One of the ways that Amazon decides what books to order in what quantity is how much traffic is going to the page. So those of you who are authors or those of you who want to see somebody's book be successful, click the Amazon page once a day. Just click it. Look at it. Um, that matters. It really matters a lot. The number of reviews that are on a book now, uh, Amazon uses an algorithm system. Nobody knows what it is. But the more reviews, it has to do with how Amazon places it, how it cross-references it, where it appears. So that's why I, we get on our authors. Get those reviews up. Get those reviews up. Get those reviews up. Because the reviews matter because it, how they find your book, how it's cross-referenced, it all matters. But yeah, Amazon is full of paid placements. John Rose uh, asked, do you think the National Park Service bookstores are your best partners for selling books? John, that is a great question. And they, uh, they are, as a matter of fact. We work very closely with all the, the visitor centers and the bookstores uh, all over from very small places like, I don't know, like Parker's Crossroads uh, to, to Gettysburg. And uh, the fact that they're closed pretty much uh, like Gettysburg, especially. I mean, it it, it has collapsed uh, revenue. I mean, it really collapses revenue. And uh, so all those wonderful women I was telling you about, their hours have been cut about 75%. And so they sort of come in and they, they you know, they, they help each other figure out what the hours are. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's real tough. And we miss them not being open. Yeah. So Dave uh, Dixon wants to know, why don't you publish more Civil War biography? Because of not, not a lot of it's written that's sent to us. And actually not that much of it really pure biography is written anyway, not as much as you'd think. Um, we get a certain amount of it, but it's usually not very good. And if we can work with it, we'll try. What's very interesting is, is when you get an author who sends something in, and if you tell them something negative, you never hear from them again. And so it's too long, or it's all passive voice, you need to work on this. 
uh, and then they argue with you, well, you're not going to work with them again. Right. So a lot of the biography stuff we've seen, I mean, I've seen a few good ones that I probably would like to have published topic wise. And, you know, you work once or twice with the author and they just, they don't want to work with you. And that's fine. I mean, it's, it's a very subjective business, but uh, otherwise we would, we would publish more. Kurt DeSoto asks, does Seth Speedy get involved in editing and book design? Yeah, we do all that. Um, in fact, we just designed, we're designing our spring 21 uh, uh, covers right now. And we've got to submit all that data and stuff in about a week, I think. And so, yeah, what we do is we ask the author to uh, give us some ideas for, for a cover. And then we put those ideas together and send those off to our designer. Typically it's Ian uh, in, uh, in London and Ian designs three or four different directions and sends them back. And then Sarah and I look at those and we talk, she talks about it from a marketing perspective and I talk about it from a different perspective. And, and then we'll go back to him and we'll just get it together until we have the cover we think is the right one. And then that'll be close. It can still be changed. Yeah. And the editing, I think we talked last time, is we have a series of editors out there. I usually do one book a season, sometimes two, because uh, I really love it, but it's, so, it's very time consuming. Um, and then we have you know, half a dozen other editors out there that our authors work with, and they go back and forth. And sometimes they butt heads, and I tell them I don't need to be involved unless you know, you're at a loggerhead, and sure enough, you know, somebody comes back and says, I can't work with this guy. And somebody else comes back, I can't work with that author. And so I'll uh, sort of, you know, try to smooth the waters a little bit and, and keep that going. But yeah, that's how we do that. Shane Reich uh, asked, can you explain the Gettysburg Trilogy? Thanks, David. Yeah, we love our covers too. Appreciate that. Um, can I explain the... The Vicksburg Trilogy. Sure. Ed Bars was the former chief historian at Vicksburg. He is... Uh, Mr. Vicksburg, really. Um, he's the guy who found the uh, gunboat in the Yazoo River, the Cairo, and helped raise it. And uh, it's on display there, although it's falling apart, which is really sad. Uh, he just, he, he wrote a, a three, big three volume set on Vicksburg. It's primarily official records and other documents. And it's a, a very straightforward, Ed is not a flowery writer. It's a very straightforward, big history of the Vicksburg camp. And it's been out of print. Morningside, the same publisher that published the Batchelder Papers, published the, the Vicksburg set. I don't think it's been printed more than once. My understanding is, is there were 500 sets at the time. That was my understanding. I don't know whether that's true. I think that's true. And uh, they haven't been reprinted since. And so, you know, we're really excited about, about doing that. Oh, I almost forgot. We are going to do a series um, I, I, I chatted with Ed Bars about this a year ago, and then I've been working with his daughter to talk with him. And we're going to, uh, I think we're going to call it the Ed Bars Classic Reprint Series. And we're going to try to bring back certain books, regimentals, battle histories that have been out of print for a long time that are really good and need to be back in print. Uh, many of you have written about the batch elder papers and getting that back in print and that sort of thing. And you've been very excited about that and say, are there any other special things you could do like that? So we started thinking about all that. We've been sort of dealing with it for a while. So we're, I think we're going to, we're going to bring that back. So if you know of books that are out of print, regimentals, biographies, campaign studies that are uh, really should be back in print and uh, something you'd like to see, you think that might be sort of popular and we're talking small runs. We're not talking about 2000 print runs. We're talking about a facsimile print. Uh, we're talking about a special new forward, something real special like that, maybe signed and numbered 300 copies, 500 copies, something like that. Um, put that in the chat, let us know, or give us some thought over the next couple of days and send me, a, send me an email. Really appreciate that. That'd be very helpful. So Charles wants to know what percentage of your books are sold through Amazon. Uh, we sell books two different ways. We sell on the book trade side, which is Amazon and bookstores, and on the non-trade side, which is to individuals, museums, and that kind of thing. Amazon makes up probably 50% of the book trade side, so probably 20, and these are just rough numbers, probably 25% of the numbers total. 
All right. 30, maybe. <laughs> John Thompson uh, says, do you attend any Civil War shows? I used to. And I used to, we used to take our own books because they weren't distributed anywhere yet. This is back in Savas publishing days, Savas Woodbury days, back in the uh, very early 90s. And then uh, a couple people bought some of our books to sell. And I went to a book show and the guy comes up to my table. I think it was Jim McLean from Butternut and Blue. And uh, I didn't used to like him. And we came to become very good friends. Uh, we we kind of butted heads the first couple of times. He says, Savas, what the hell are you doing here? I said, uh, I'm at the book show selling books. He says, but I bought your books to sell. Are you competing? You're competing with a vendor. <laughs> I never thought about it. And I thought, Jesus, Jim, you're right. I am. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that again. And I didn't. And, uh, and then he bought me dinner and bought me drinks. And I don't even know how we found our way back to the hotel. We became great friends. And so I stopped going to civil war shows as a vendor. And, uh, I always enjoyed and met a lot of people, but, um, so I don't usually get civil war shows anymore because I can't sell books and I, I it's hard for me to travel. Yeah. I'm so, on the wrong coast. I ended up on the wrong coast. I don't know. <laughs> So Kurt DeSoto uh, wants to know, uh, how about wholesaler shows? No. And the reason is, is because our distributor covers the wholesale shows. So the distributor who handles all the wholesale markets, follow it and, and library stuff and all, uh, the distributors cover those shows. All right. Although um, we do go to book expo every year. This year it was canceled. Usually it's in New York. And uh, that's a very interesting show. Uh, and so we do go to Book Expo, which is gigantic. Uh, and really, a, if you've never been to a Book Expo and you have a chance, uh, they let the public in, I think the second day. I don't know if it's free to the public or not the second day. I think it is. It's unbelievably jaw-dropping. It's so big. It's so massive. There are so many books released that you sit down to kind of catch your breath the first time you go in. It's like nothing you've ever seen it's and it's publishers all over the world it's magnificent wow yeah kurt says that there's a, a book expo in dc uh there might be once in a while they have it in dc it's almost always in new york beautiful well we seem to run out have run out of questions if there are any more let's get them in Javits Center. Yeah, Javits Center is where we usually go. Yeah. You guys, this is really, really helpful. And I see so many things that are going to be helpful. If you, if there's anything we can do as a business that you think we should be doing, please tell me. If there's anything that you want to see published, please tell me. We're thinking about bringing back Civil War regiments. A lot, a lot of you were, used to subscribe to that. Um, as an online, um, as an online publication, so we're thinking about that. And uh, so anything you want to see, anything you want to do, anything you want us to do, anything we should be doing better that we're not doing correctly, please let us know. We really appreciate all that. So this, uh, this interview the, <laughs> where we have uh, really uh, received a, a great deal of information. And thank you, Ted. Um, is going to be on our YouTube channel. I'm, I'm going to do a little editing and pump that up there uh, w within the next couple of days. Sure. Send your, uh, send your, uh, your friends, your colleagues, uh, your librarians to, uh, uh, to our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe, but, uh, but use this as, as a way to, um, to get more information to Ted and Savas Beatty. I'm answering a few questions on the side. David Roth has, has the blue and gray. I've tried to work with him. Dave's a good friend of mine and, and it's just, uh, he's got other interests now and doing other things. And so we haven't been able to bind all those up, but that's a great idea. Matt Shelder should, should be here in the middle of August. We just heard that this morning. Um, yeah, these are kind of, I wish I, emerging revolutionary world books. We have more of those on the way, you know, Oh, I'd love to answer all these now. I see so many questions I should answer. Yeah. Germantown, that'll be out uh, in about a month. 
or outside my window special jam. That's you advertising the book. I love it. Thank you very much. Two ninety nine. Yeah. You guys, honestly, thank you for your time. Your time is everything, and and I I, I really appreciate it. And all you do to, to help us and keep us in business and reading good books, we really appreciate it more than you know. So every, everyone, we uh, we're we're gonna be having more uh, more interviews. Probably not as good as this one, I'll tell you. But um, um, keep keep your your ear to the uh, to the ground and um, and keep tuned in to Civil War oh. Roundtable Congress. Yeah, and I just typed. Somebody just asked earlier. I just typed the name of our band in the chat. It's called Arminius. That's a uh, it was a, a German trained Roman general, uh, German, uh, Roman trained German general. Uh, so it's Arminius. And on Facebook, it's Arminius the band. And, uh, and you can see some of our stuff there. And uh, I, think you'll, I think you'll like it, but don't let me scare you. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, folks. Thanks, guys. All right. Good night. Have a good day. Thank you. It's Mike. Thanks, Ted. Thank you.